Yes, yeah, so this is the paper, Basic Polymorphic Type Checking by Luca Cardelli. It's basically about the hindler minler type checker, and it's written for people who aren't already uh, type theorists. It's a lovely paper. <laughs> I consider doing the, uh, using the paper as my slides, but that would have been horrifically boring, I think. Like this. Some code, there's some mathematical squiggly things. And at the end, incidentally, there's the. Uh, this is actually unusual for a paper like this. Uh, there's the implementation. Um, so if you can't read the mathematical squigglies or, or the prose, you can actually look at the code to see, um, to figure out how the, the type system is implemented. If you can read modular 2. <laughs> Unfortunately, not a lot of people can these days. It's fairly straightforward. Lots of like long keywords. Oh, hello. Uh, that should go away once I go full screen, so don't clap <coughs> um, So I figured I'd actually just implement it for you. So I've, I've got some slides first. But I figured I'd literally just, uh, instead of just going through the paper and, and, and talking all the time, I'm actually going to implement a type checker for the language described in, in the paper, a very small toy language, uh, live on stage in a, a modern language, as it were. I'll leave that as a surprise. So, this is Robin Milner. He's the, uh, the one on the right. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always thought this, this was such a, a, a lovely photograph, but he looks quite sinister when I see him. The other one, Hindley. The other one is indeed Roger Hindley, yes. <laughs> so, let's um, talk about type checking. Um, so, am I in a room full of, of like advanced type theorists, or, or are there people here who actually don't really have much experience with types at all? Show our hands, like um, Lispers or <laughs> Ruby programmers, or that, that kind of thing. <laughs> Couple of you, good. Okay, so the hardcore type theorists, <laughs> that, that's more than I wanted, but at least that's still, like half the room. Right, so um, I'm going to go through the basics. This is um, the notation we're going to be using. We're saying that the value one has type int, int meaning integer, meaning a number, um, a number without a decimal point, and so on and so on. Um, so the first exercise, what is the type for this? Anybody care to guess? You're going to have to say it, or I'm just going to stand here and wait for you all day. Int. Nice one. <laughs> Getting good at this. Okay, so uh, let's let's talk about functions. So in our toy language, we have a function named zero, which uh, takes an integer as its argument and returns a boolean. We we uh, write that as zero colon int to bool. Now, um, oh, I should mention the uh, the syntax for defining a function is what you can see on the bottom there. Uh, fun, because obviously functions are a lot of fun. Uh, it takes an argument n, and the body of the function follows, which is um, zero of n. That's a function invocation for the function zero. Which means, can we deduce the uh, type of this function? Int to boo. Oops. That was a very good guess. Okay. How about this one? Function and n. This is the, the classic. This is the identity function. How do you type the identity function? Uh, for this, we are going to have to introduce a new concept. So maybe I'm not going to let you guess. Because, I mean, this could be int to int. This could be bool to bool. Are we agreed on that? Uh, this could even be function of int to bool to function of int to bool. Um, so the way we describe that, because this could be any type, essentially. We basically just take the input and, and return it unchanged. Any, any value that the language can, can cope with. So, 
for that, we have the idea of, of type variables. And we write type variables in, in our little language as uh, lowercase letters, just by convention. Uh, so this is a function from A to A, which tells us that we don't know what type A is, but the input and the output are going to have the same type. So let's return to the, uh, the function that calls zero of interval. How did we actually figure out the type of that? go through it, what we were actually doing. I mean, um, it, it, it seemed pretty obvious when we were just looking at it, but, but we need to sort of make rules for this. So um, if we look at, at the, uh, the actual code, um, so the variable n, we don't know what type that is, so we'll just uh, make that a type variable a. And the output of the function we don't know what that is, uh, so we'll call that type variable, type variable b, and so the type of the function will be a to b. But we know that uh, zero has type int to bool, which means that because we're calling zero with n, and the return value of zero becomes the return value of the function, we know that a must be int and b must be bool. What we did here was a thing called unification, which um, obviously the first thing you, you, that comes to mind when I say unification is the famous episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, where Spock goes to wherever it was and, and does something. Um, <laughs> but what it actually is, is something from, from um, logic programming, essentially, or actually logic uh, in a broader sense. So, uh, Actually, what a type checker is, is just a, sort of a, a specialized logic engine. And unification is at the core of it. But I've talked enough. I'm going to start actually writing some code. First, I'm going to introduce you to the toy language. Um, the toy language, there's, can you read the code? Should I make it larger? Good, because I don't think I can make it larger. Uh, you might have to, no, 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 I think it's working. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. I'm sorry, it just scales to fit the screen and apparently we've got a lot of room. So, if you can't read it, you might want to move closer to the screen. Anyway, <coughs> if you can see the screen, here's factorial in um, the uh, toy language. Oh, sorry, I need to compile this. Factorial. So we define a function that takes n, and, and we have an if statement, or rather an if expression, because it needs to actually return a value, which goes if something, then something, else something. And we know function uh, invocation already, and this bit that's going on here is, is uh, basically um, currying. That's because the, the language only takes single um, argument functions. So to take two arguments, you'd have to make a function that returns a function that takes the second argument, basically. And so it defines this, and it, um, it defines this as, as factorial in the left segment. So this, this is just a, a straight up binding. I've actually simplified the, uh, the language in the paper, which, ha which is distinguished between uh, less bindings and recursive less bindings. So I've just made everything recursive, just to save some time. And I feel like there's another change I made too, but I can't remember. Oh yes, uh, the, uh, the language in the paper that makes you have to define every number that you're going to use as an int. Whereas I've cheated and just made everything that looks like a number be an int. So, uh, this program though is really interesting because I don't understand what it's supposed to do. Um, this isn't, to my mind, the normal implementation of a factorial. This is function times n, which then calls um, factorial of, of n minus 1. And I have no idea what the times function actually does. If anybody can explain it to me, I'd be very grateful. I figured it might be like some kind of higher order function thing going on, but I have no idea. And the paper doesn't explain it. 
but the paper does give us the type of the function, so it doesn't really matter. But we're not going to run this program, we're just going to type check it. So, um, the language has a parser that I wrote in JavaScript. Did I mention, by the way, I'm using JavaScript? Actually, TypeScript, but uh, I'm not going to be using types. I figured I, I'd pick a language that everybody would be able to sort of um, read and, and sort of understand if, if we don't get too tricky, like, you know, JavaScript 2 plus string 2, and string 22, because obviously, mm -hmm. 2 minus string 2, that's an error. Mm -hmm. That's good, at least. That's just TypeScript. In, in regular JavaScript, this works, and at least so there's like either 0 or not a number. I think it's 0. JavaScript is magical. Uh, where was I? Where was I talking about JavaScript? Um, anyway. Yes, uh, I wrote a parser in JavaScript for the language. So I can go like parse one. <laughs> that returns an ID of value one. What's that? Hope so. Or I could do the, the identity function from AA. That returns, this is basically the AST that has been passed. So there's basically the um, AST uh, nodes are JavaScript objects with um, a type field and a name field sometimes. And it's, it all depends because JavaScript is, is quite untyped and I can go wild with. The structure of this, but all of them have a type which describes uh, what the node is for. And yeah, you can sort of, you don't really need to figure out the details of it. So I've got these functions to generate AST nodes, but we're not actually going to use them. Um, so you get the general idea. I can pass. A string, I can print it back out. You take the AST form and print some code, and it goes back and forth. And I've not written an eval for this. I can't actually run these programs. But the point is to type check them, not to run them. And I'm going to have to write a type checker to do that. So I've pre written a bit of code because this would have been boring. Also, I don't know how to type the fancy Unicode characters my keyboard. So basically, um, I'm using um, I'm using types in about the same way as I'm using AST nodes here. So I got a, basically there are two types of type in, in this type system. There's the type variable, for which I have a function called var, which takes any unique ID and returns something with a type and a name on it. Type says var and name is one. And I got the operator, op, which takes a name, and any number of arguments from zero to, nothing, to, to anything. So it could, uh, that, the arguments are other types, incidentally. So I could do like r1, r2, and that's what the operator looks like, but that's sort of beside the point. So I use these two to define um, the more interesting types. For instance, int. Int is an operator with uh, the name int and no arguments. Same with bool. And I've got uh, a function type. Let's say we make a function from int to bool. So I've got these, uh, these uh, functions to construct my types, essentially. And what comes out is the uh, it's the JavaScript object rep representing the type. So, and there's one more type, the pair type, which is a tuple of length two, of, of two distinct types. And that is sufficient to uh, type the toy language in the paper and then some. I got a function to compare Types called the same type. That was very boring to write, so goodbye. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to need is the 
because type variables need to have unique names to distinguish them from each other. We're going to have to set up a facility to, to make sure that we always generate unique names when we create them. And that's just doing JavaScript. We set up a variable that we just keep incrementing every time we call the function to get a new variable. We're going to call that uh, fresh var. And that's going to be basically the current value of next bar. And to make that a string, obviously we use the, the clever JavaScript uh, trick of um, adding the number to an empty string, which is going to coerce it into a string. After we've done that, we're going to increment the variable for next time. And then we make a var out of it. That should do it. Check how it works. Fresh var. That's a variable with name one. I call it again, it keeps doing name one. I should probably explain that one because that's probably not what you'd expect to see. Uh, my code is actually working, but the thing is, every time I type, um, I type something in my REPL on the right hand side, it will take that code and the code on the left hand side and recompile it and run that. So every time I run something here, it's going to reinitialize re next bar. What, what I made it, like <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> you, you can create a list of two results of two applications, right? Yes, good idea. Very good idea. Let's go crazy. Let's do like three. So that's one, two, and three. It works at least. Yeah, so so don't look too hard at my REPL. It was, it's written in JavaScript. What can you do? Um, so now we've got the, the ability to create VARs. We should probably actually put that to some kind of use. So, so we're going to uh, head towards the, the unify function. But to get there, I'm going to make another function. I'm going to call it prune, which takes a type. And the idea here is, or the idea of unify, is we're going to go all in on the mutable code today. So you'll notice this is what a type variable looks like. And when I've discovered that a type variable is actually something else, which is basically what unify is, I'm just going to record that in the variable itself. I'm going to add a field called instance to it, which points to the thing that it's unified with. But usually when, when I see a type variable that's been unified, I don't want to actually deal with that variable. I want to deal with a thing that it's unified with. Like say, if we know variable A is int, um, when I ask for it, I don't want to have variable A, I want to have the actual int. So I'm going to write a function that just walks through the instance links and returns the one at the end. So that's pretty simple. If type type is var, if it's a variable, and if the type has an instance field, then we return prune of type of instance. Essentially recursing until we the end, which is where we just return the type itself. So now for the unification. Unify, <laughs> type one, type two. So the idea here is to record that type one and type two are actually the same thing. Um, this is going to be a function that doesn't return anything. It's just going to either um, mutably record the fact that type variable a equals int or, or whatever, or it's going to fail. If I try to say that int and bool are the same, which obviously they're not, that's going to have to be an error. That's actually a type error. So we're going to be throwing exceptions for that. But first, we're going to prune these two. T1 and T2, and these are the pruned versions. These are the fully resolved type variables, as it were. T1 type is var. 
first room, if uh, the first type is a type variable, and if it's not the same type as the other one, if of course I'm going to need to write this function afterwards, occurs in type t1, t2, which is going to detect whether um, t1 actually is inside t2 somewhere, either if a variable points to itself somewhere down the road, or if uh, an, an operator contains uh, this variable. That would be a problem. So we're going to throw an error for that. Because of unification, it's very bad. Um, if, it doesn't occur, if T1 doesn't occur in T2, then that's cool. Then we record that uh, T1 and T2 are the same. Let's see, where are we now? Yeah. So, else if, if T2.type is a variable, so basically, um, if t1 is not a variable, but t2 is, then we're going to have to do the same. And we're not going to repeat that code. We're just going to call unify with the um, function split. Done. At this point, uh, we know that both t1 and t2 are, in fact, operators, because they're not variables. We only have a two, a two kinds. And an operator. It's basically a list of other types in the arguments field. So what we're going to have to do here is make sure that uh, every type in the arguments field actually unifies. But first, we can have a look at if they're the same name. So if the names of, of the operators are different, that means they won't unify. Or If t t two of its length, or if the the length of the argument list differs, they also won't unify. So, if we've gotten this far, then it's time for the for loop. No, sorry, uh, we need to throw this error, don't we? This is a type mismatch and at this point I think I'm going to need I need to <coughs> stop using the fancy JavaScript too by the way I'm going to need a, a print function for my types I think I'm going to write that later too so print t1 is uh, not equal to So basically I'm saying, uh, these types are clearly different, we can't unify them, throw an error. And if that succeeds, it is now time for my for loop. We start at zero, and we stop, and we've reached the end of the list, and we increment. Good old school C style for loop. And what we're going to do inside here is basically we're going to take um, first argument uh, zero of both types and argument one and argument two and so on, depending on how many there are. And we're going to unify each of them in turn. That's all. Right. Here with me so far. Basically, uh, Two easy rules for unification. If uh, one or, or both are variables, then we just record on the first variable that um, it's equal to the other variable just by literally mutating it. Um, if both are, are, are operators, we need to go through the argument lists of each operator and unify everything. 
And if we notice something that won't unify, then <coughs> we just spray an arrow. This is the print. Print type. We can be pretty straightforward about that. Right now, I'm just going to. How about this? Right? Return json.stringify. So that's going to give us a nice string. Is that too? Yeah, come on, let's, let's make an effort. It's only two different types anyway. Switch type type. Actually, we're going to prune it first. So that if we have a type variable A that we know is int, we don't want to print type variable A, we want to actually print int. I don't know. That's what the paper called it. <laughs> I would have called it something else, I'm pretty sure. Okay. So I'm just switching. It's either var. In which case, it's very simple. We just return var.name. No, oh, sorry. t.name. If it's op, then uh, we're going to get fancy. If it has no arguments, we just return its name. Like uh, int, for instance, has no arguments, so we want to just return int. If length is 2, that's like, like a fancy function type. We want to print argument 0, name, argument 1. So it goes int 2 bool or whatever. So that's uh, print. First argument and the space and the name of the operator and another space and print t args one. There we go. And now for the base case, you know we don't actually have any types that are going to be anything but zero or two. So let's just return. Joe. <laughs> so if we see a type that's named Hello Joe, we know that something went really wrong. Well. Okay, let's just test. Oops. Oh yeah, it doesn't have a curse and type code. Just gonna write that in. What is the signature of that now? It should just be um, the in type. Now it compiles, so I can test my print function at least. Print int says int. Print function of int to bool. It says int to bool. That's very nice. Oh, and what about variables? Int to bool. Uh, fresh bar. Int to one. Which is a bit counterintuitive, of course. Uh, the, uh, the, the name of the variable is just a mono monotonically integer, so that's what we're going to get. For now, I think, time permitting, I'm going to get fancy on the print function later. Um, but first I need to write recursing type real quick. Oops. As always, we prune the type. And then if it's uh, the same type, then, oops. then yes. You do re you do occur in yourself. If it's uh, an op, we need to go through the list of arguments and make sure that this type doesn't occur in any of those. Which I'm going to write another function called occurs in, which takes a list of types. And if neither of those, then uh, return false if the type didn't occur in the other type. And real quick, the equivalent occurs in the function, which is very simple to do. Types to signify a list. For let type of types, if occurs in type, in type, return true. Otherwise, return false at the end of the for loop. So now, actually, unification shouldn't be compiled.
turn and walk. Okay. This is going to be exciting. What can we unify? Hint and boo. Who want to see the first type error? Type mismatch. Int and boo don't unify. How about int and int? Ah, it accepts that. How about int and, and fresh one? It accepts that, but we don't really see what's going on here, so let's get fancy. Let A is fresh bar. Unify into A. Uh, I should just be able to return it. Yeah. So you'll notice now that A is, is has type var and name one as you'd expect. But it also has an instant which points to int. So we're now uh, recording that a and int are the same. Which means that if I print a, it should no longer say one, it should say int. So that works. I'd like to say we're almost done. to have to move on to the uh, analyze now because so now we, we can we can uh, sort of reason about types but we can't reason about programs yet so the next big function is going to be uh, the function called analyze which instead of, of two taking two types to unify it will take uh, an AST and it's going to tell us uh, the type of the AST node or it's going to uh, give us a type error, if there's the type error. But to get there, we're going to need some more utility functions. Because um, there's this thing about generic type variables and non-generic type variables. And I'm actually just going to skim very lightly over the, the difference between them. But the idea is that generic type variables will be freshly instantiated in, in, in every new scope that they exist in. And non-generic type variables are always the same in, in the scope. And the rule is, if I recall correctly, um, the argument to, um, to a function declaration is always non-generic, and the binding for a recursive letter declaration is always non-generic, and everything else is generic. But to actually keep track of which is which, we are going to need to keep a list of um, of variables that are non-generic and we need a function called fresh which is the name it had in the paper and I also don't know why they called it fresh um, this one's a bit peculiar okay. so If it's a var and if it's generic, we're going to need to write that function, but it's very simple. Basically, um, this generic function will look up uh, whether t exists in the list called non-gen. And if it does, that means it's not generic. And so, So essentially, uh, what Fresh is meant to do is, if uh, we have a non-generic type variable, we, uh, we return that. And if we have a generic type variable, we uh, Fresh it, unless we've already done it once in, in this Fresh call. T. So if it's uh, not generic, we just return it unchanged. And if 
if it's an op, we have to go through the arguments as usual and call fresh on these in case there are generic type arguments. And finally, we just call the inner function. So the inner function is just because we have the mutable state in the outer function to record whether we've already created a, 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 a fresh generic variable. Don't worry about this one too much. Though. It's not the exciting one. So I need a function here, don't I? Yes, it's generic. is generic. It's pretty straightforward. Once we got that, we can get to the interesting stuff. Basically, I'm reusing Occursin, but I'm just... Uh, I'm going through a list, checking if, if the type variable is in there, and then if it is, that means we're not generic, so we flip truthiness of the result here. So now that compiles. <clears throat> and it's getting a late, so I'm just going to go straight for the, the analyze. Actually, I need a wrapper for the thing that's fresh stuff. I'm about to introduce a new idea now uh, of the environment which, uh, if you've written an interpreter, the, the environment is basically where you store your variable bindings, right? Um, in the type checker, this is where we store uh, our types. Basically, uh, types that are bound to uh, variables in the program, as opposed to type variables. So like we can have, uh, for the zero function, for instance, that I showed you at the start, we will have a binding for zero to function of interval. For, for the number zero, we would have a binding to int. But as I'm going to show you in this function, I'm going to cheat with the int. So first of all, if the name exists in env, then we get the value out of n, that's going to be a type, and then we call fresh on it, so that we genericize the generic uh, type variables. And here's my hack. If the name is obviously just an integer, then we return type int. Otherwise, that's an error. We don't have a definition for this. Undefined symbol plus uh, name. Okay, so I need the isInt function. IsInt any string. How do I determine whether a string is obviously an integer? Regular expressions! Let's do it! So s dot match. So who's an expert in regular expressions? It's too easy. You're no fun. At least I need to, to match the start and the end of the string. Backslash d class. Really? I would just do the, the, the full on explicit thing. But both work, obviously. You kids nowadays need a special syntax in your regular expressions. When I was young, we didn't have backslash d. But we got it in, what, is that per? In like probably early 80s? Actually, that was when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so let's check that function. Isn't foo. Oops. Null. I think that's right. Obviously, in, in JavaScript, uh, null is false, and uh, most things that don't look like they should be false are, are true, but not necessarily everything. But so basically, this is going to 
Countess Fawcy, and it's in 1337. That returns a list containing 1337, which should be true. Let's actually just sort of fix that. I don't trust it. <laughs> that returns true and false. Basically, I do a double inversion because the, the inversion operator is going to take anything truthy and turn it into false and vice versa. And doing that twice will make sure that you have a, a, a wonderful well of JavaScript. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to try and type check that. Well, TypeScript did. It seems happy with it. But TypeScript has to be happy with a lot of things because the underlying language is JavaScript, which always gets exciting. <laughs> so is, is TypeScript Oh, no. Oh no, oh, what the, <laughs> the nice thing about Henry Miller, which I probably should have mentioned at the start, is that it has perfect type imprints. It, it, it's such a regular uh, type system that you don't ever have to write any types because it's always able to infer what the type of everything is going to be. Whereas in JavaScript, it's a little different. <laughs> it's, I, I mean, just the, the, the thing where you have to try and invent a type system for a language that wasn't designed to have one. And especially one that's so irregular as JavaScript, <coughs> the type system is going to be to have to make allowances for a lot of stuff that's just common in the language, and there's nothing you can do about it. And so, yeah, this is very far from in the middle. If you're interested? It, it's it's um, it's a graduate type language, and there's a lot of cool papers written on that. But, I mean, you could rather have a look at the type bracket. I don't know, but there's a lot of cool papers on, on type bracket, which bracket being a slightly more predictable language than JavaScript is probably slightly easier to write a, a, a type checker for. Anyway, we've got to write the analyze function. This is where the, the action is. This is where we take the, uh, the AST and an environment and non gen. But non gen defaults to the empty list. But, and realizing we don't have an environment, let's define one. This is the exciting, like, growing a language thing, isn't it? So I'm going to make a function called standard n, which returns a fresh environment with our functions defined. So this is why we get to be creative and design a, a standard library. First, we're going to need the booleans, true, is of type bool, false is of type bool, zero, remember that one, function of int to bool. Uh, we're going to go all in, aren't we? We're going to define like uh, an entire numeric tower. We're going to have suck and pet. If, oh no, that's built into the language. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You, 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 there's, I'm, I'm actually remembering uh, the Scala implementation that I originally read instead of the modular 2 thing that I couldn't understand. Actually, it does this. It has a function called cont instead of the if construct. But I thought I'd go all in on the if construct, so I'm not going to do that one. I am going to do suck and pret, obviously. Uh, if you've got integers, you need to be able to. to to operate on them, right? So we've got plus, minus, uh, multiply, and divide, right? Nah, nah. That's, that's for cowards. We've got suck and pred. Suck increases an integer by one, and pred increases it, decreases it by one. What else do you need? So they both have uh, type int to int. And they're going to do the weird times function in, that was in the factorial that I've no idea what it's supposed to do, but I know it's type because it was in the paper. It's a function from int to function from int to int, which basically uh, one assumes means that it's just a function that takes two integer arg arguments and returns an integer. And I'm going to I'm going to do the pair 
just because we have a pair type. So pair will be a function that takes uh, two values and returns a, a pair of the two, which means that it's a function from, we're going to need to declare some type variables for this. Pair left is fresh bar. Right is a fresh bar, which means that it's a function from pair left to a function from pair right. That's once again just a way of getting two arguments, and returns a pair of pair left and pair right, and that should do it for a standard library. It's like twice as much as JavaScript had originally, anyway. So that's it. Now, we do need to get to the exciting part. So let's write analyze. Analyze, pretty straightforward. We're going to examine the um, type of the AST node if it's an ID. So, analyze, do you know the type checking or type inferring? Both. It's going to do the type checking while it's inferring the type of the AST node. The AST is not, it, it has no type information. Obviously, it, it is type because we're able to type check it. But there is no type information in the AST, it's just uh, describing the code. No type annotations. So we're going to use the, the AST to infer the, the, the only possible type, essentially. But for the ID, that's just a simple lookup in the environment. For get type that I wrote previously. Should probably return that. JavaScript does need explicit return for the most part. And I'm going to add, just so I can start playing with it, I'm just going to add a default case, which is just going to fail. Type known AST node, which means already I can start type checking, theoretically. Analyze, pass. Standard, I'm going to write a function for this. Uh, function check, which is just going to take a string and it's going to analyze, analyze the past string with the standard environment applied and it's going to print type. So I can just go check with some code now, <coughs> basically. So I should be able to check what? It's an int. Already we've got results. Check A, undefined symbol A, because A is not in the standard environment. However, zero is. And that's interval. So that's the start. It's not very clever yet. The empty string, that should be an invalid program. That's a pass error. Because um, a program here is, has got to be one expression, only one expression. Okay. Let's type check something more interesting. How about a function? Okay. How do I type check a function? I need to figure out all the types that I can. So the type of the argument, that's unknown, so we're going to do a fresh bar. And the type of the result, that would be uh, the type of the body of the function, right? So I'm going to analyze that. Analyze, st.body, uh, but I need to add the uh, argument to the environment. Let's do a library here. ast.arg.name is archetype. And I mentioned the archetype is always non generic. So I'm going to add that. Okay, so that's the argument type and the result type. And that means the 
type of this is going to be function from argument type to result type. Function from the type of the argument to the type of the result. That seems reasonable, yeah? So is this a switch thing? Is that a standard model switch thing? Or? Yeah. Yes. Is that a new thing? No, it's been there for a long time, but it was sort of frowned upon for a while. And then around the time Redux started getting popular, it, it sort of made a comeback. But it's a little bit iffy, but so, so is all the JavaScript. So it's fine. <laughs> Right, uh, I think now I should be able to actually type check the identity function. Yeah. <laughs> so, so three to three, that's uh, three of course being a type variable because we haven't done anything to print to print those. That's the type of A. So that seems to work. This is exciting. Now I'm just gonna charge towards the big one I think. I'm, I'm gonna. Uh, write out the rest of the rules and I'm going to type check uh, factorial. Which means I'm going to need uh, core function application. That's, I get the type of the function that I'm calling and the type of the argument that I'm applying. Argument. These are both uh, subnodes of the uh, of the call, so these are easy to get. Now the result type. I'm going to need to make a fresh var, and I'm going to need to unify those. This is finally where unify comes in, because type checking the identity function that's that's pretty trivial, but. The, uh, the way you call uh, functions is usually where, where the type system gets the clues about what types actually apply. So I'm recording that function from arg type to rest type is the same as the function type. And then I return the rest type, the type of the result of the invocation. Actually, at this point, there's, there's a simple program I can type check. Do you remember our friend Zero? <coughs> Instable? <laughs> We're not done yet. Actually, at this point, it's sort of just the tedious bit left. It's the, uh, the if and the let. But we've gotten this far. I'm going to type them out real quick. That's just weird. It creates a new environment, of course, with the binding. The name of the left hand of the binding is the new type. And we need the type of the thing that we are binding to. And I realize that. Then that needs to have the new type as an ungeneric variable. Okay. And then we unify new type and the type of the thing that it's being bound to are the same. And then we return the type of the body. So basically we introduce um, a new type into the environment temporarily and we analyze the, uh, the body of the binding with that new environment. And now the if. So the type of the predicate is analyzing the pred with the n non-gen. 
and at this point, we're going to make sure that the, uh, the predicate part of the if statement needs to unify with bool, because obviously, because we're not like JavaScript or anything. It has to evaluate to a boolean. That's a rule. Analyze ASTS and non general. So I called the, the then part yes and the else part no, just for clarity here. So we get the um, type of the yes and the type of the no. And another rule of the if statement is that those two have to return the same type. So basically, the three parts of the if statement, the predicate must unify with bool. And the yes hand and the no hand have to unify with each other because the if statement has to return the same type. No Can matter which way it goes. Uh -huh. Oh, good call. That could have been a type error. Well, let me explain type error. So I'm unifying yes type and no type. And so what can I do return? Out of curiosity. It's actually either yes type or no type because they're going to be the same. I was just curious whether you're, you're sort of yes people or no people. <laughs> I'll go with yes type. And that actually, I think, there's one little thing I'm going to do at the end. But I think this is it for the, the type system. So let's just check that we have factorial here still. This Harry thing that uses all our langu language features, <laughs> we're going to type check that then. Check factorial. <laughs> now let's just check something with a type error just to make sure as well. I'm going to use the thing from the uh, paper where you have a function that takes f, which should be a function, and you make a pair of f of 3 and f of true. I think that's the right amount of parentheses. We've got Lisbeth in the room, does that look right? I think so. So basically, uh, because we don't have anything like union types in the language, um, and we, we are calling f with an int, and then we are calling f with a boolean, and that should not be possible because it can't be both in and boolean. So this should be a type error. It says type mismatch bool unequal int. That's cool. That's just this one little niggling thing I'm going to do right at the end because it's been bothering me all day. Function a of a type checks to three, function from three to three. That's ugly. What I'm going to do is my print. Change you a bit. some extra stuff. Just the plan is I'm going to temporarily bind like one, two, and three and all that unreadable stuff in, into pretty type variables A, B, and C and so on just for the print because I'm assuming that the type variables when you read them will be local to the type itself. So uh, we're just going to sort of pretty print them. So I'm going to have a next character A and get the character code for that, the ASCII code essentially. Function next name returns converting it back and increment it. So the first time I'm calling, huh? Yeah, so, so the idea is every time I call next name inside the print function, I'm going to get A, B, C, D, and so on. And then just record them while I'm printing. So the quick change here is for a var if, if 
I've generated a name for this one already. Get it out of the cache as that name's next name. Vars, T dot name, first name, return name. And that should pretty much be it, except of course I need to call print type here. So we don't reset the uh, variable binding. Isn't there one more? No, there isn't. Okay. So now, instead of the only three to three, the idea is we're going to get like a nice and, and, and a melee uh, A to A. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, don't speak all at once. I didn't call it. Oh, of course. At the end, I'm obviously going to have to call print type. <laughs> Good God. I could have spent all night doing that. <laughs> no? Didn't I? Yeah. Ah! <laughs> I get so used to, to languages that aren't like Java or JavaScript with implicit return. Ah! Return. <laughs> Nice. Oh my god. It just checks that the other error gets pumped out. Yeah. <laughs> Good call. It, it doesn't allow that. Okay. That was pretty much it. I have my, my cheat sheet here if I screwed everything up. This is the working implementation. Now, just in case there are academics in the audience, uh, you might not have, you might have been wondering what I've been doing for the past hour, just <laughs> typing out all this like practical stuff. So this is the um, from the end of the paper, the uh, the rules in, in magical mathematical notation. You got that? Good. Here are some more. And obviously, um, I would be remiss if I didn't include a cat gif at the end of my talk, so there you go. It's a nice big cat. <laughs> That's all. Thank you so much.